All right, so here we are picking up again with section four, um, reviewing classification. Sometimes we call that the science of taxonomy and energy flow, um, which is all about ecosystem dynamics. All right, so according to last year's SOL results, which has nothing to do with you all, um, but if we're studying data for any reason, um, I guess this was an area that was confusing to last year's eighth graders. So we want to really pay close attention to this because it is a lot of information. Um, the main things you need to know about classification are, first of all, the eight levels of classification. So first of all, scientists um, group living things into categories or levels, sometimes called taxa. Let's highlight that word right there. Okay, uh, based on similarities. That's a very important part. You might want to even jot that down. Scientists group things together um, based on similarities. Similarities in appearance, DNA, evolutionary history, homologous structures, all of those things. Now, to remember the eight layers or eight levels, um, I taught my kids last year a little silly saying, um, dumb kangaroos playing cards on fat green snakes, okay? Now, what that actually stands for, domain, which is the most general or most broad level, which is why it's kind of arranged in this upside down pyramid. The domain has almost all of the members of the living things on this planet. And there are three domains, and we'll get to that in a minute. After domain, you have the four kingdoms. Well, there are six kingdoms, but in the eukarya domain, there are four kingdoms. Then we have the phylum or phyla for plural, and then class, and then order, family, genus, and species. Now, if you look at the word species, where's my underline button? Mm, I have no idea. But anyway, we'll go back to highlighting. If you look at the word species, maybe underline the first few letters, S-P-E-C-I, -S which is also the first few letters of the word specific. Coincidence? I think not. All right. The species level is the most specific. Only one member is in this species level. We go from everything that's alive. We, we start with all living things on the planet and we narrow that down to one specific organism. Okay. All right. So that's the first page. All right. So there are three domains, like I mentioned. Eukarya, which means those organisms all have eukaryotic cells. And as a refresher, a eukaryotic cell is a cell that has a true nucleus where the DNA is found inside the nucleus. This is most things that you know about. Most things that you see outside that are alive are members of the eukarya domain. They have eukaryotic cells. And then we have this bacteria domain, which is all of the bacteria that you've ever heard about. Now, bacteria are prokaryotic. Pro means no. Prokaryotic means cells that do not have a true nucleus. Their DNA is floating in the cytoplasm. The bacteria that belong to this domain are stuff that kind of makes you sick. Strep. If you've ever had strep throat, it's caused by a bacteria in this domain. If you've ever had a staph infection on your skin, staph is a bacteria that is found in this domain. Even the good bacteria that's found in your stomach that help digest your food, that is also found in the bacteria domain. Now, very rarely are there, well, I shouldn't say rarely, they're probably very numerous on the planet, but we don't come in contact much with these guys. The archaea bacteria domain, Archaea, kind of like when you think of archaic or archaeology, means really, really old, okay? So this is probably, what's fascinating about this, is the first living things on the planet were members of this domain. The bacteria that can exist almost anywhere. They can live in extreme environments. They live in thermal um, vents under the, in the ocean, um, basically in boiling water, and they can also live in like polar ice caps. So they can either be frozen or boiling, and they can still survive, whereas regular bacteria in this domain um, cannot usually survive, which is why when you boil things, you disinfect it. Um, that's because you're killing the bacteria. So three domains, eukarya, bacteria, archaea bacteria. Okay, now, we obviously are members of this domain, the eukarya domain. We have eukaryotic cells, and in that domain are four kingdoms. 
obviously, animalia, animals, that's us, plantae, the plants, fungi, the fungi, and protista, which are protists. Now, these are like kind of weird things that really don't fit into any of these categories, but they are eukaryotic, and that would be your paramecium's and your amoebas and things like that. This is a little paramecium right here. And obviously mushrooms, molds, and mildews are all the fungi. The plants are the plants, and of course the animals are the animals. All right, moving on to some common animal phyla. Um, it should be phyla right there because phyla is plural. All right, so we are chordata. We're members of the chordata phylum, and that just means that we have a backbone. It stems from the word uh, notochord or spinal cord. Um, so that's where we get our phylum name. So this is actually a very small group of animals. Only 5% of the world's animals actually have a backbone, but it's all the birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, and amphibians. The largest animal phylum, so going from the smallest to the largest, are the arthropods. Remember, arthro means joint, pod means leg or foot. So this literally are a group of animals that have jointed legs. So that's all of your arachnids, which are your spiders and ticks and things like that, your crustaceans, your crabs, your lobsters, your, um, what are they called? Crawfish, stuff like that. Insects, which of course is huge. And then even your millipedes and centipedes are all members of the arthropod phylum. Cnidarians, those are the ones with the stinging cells like the jellyfish and the anemones. Echinoderms, echino means spiny, derm means skin. And those are your starfish and your sand dollars and your sea urchins. The Annelida phylum, Anna means ring in Latin. Okay, so that might help you because all of the little earthworms and leeches in the world, um, those segmented worms, they look like they have rings around them. So the Annelies are the segmented worms. And then finally, um, this was easy to remember because we dissected one of these, our little squid. We're members of the Mollusca phylum, which means kind of a soft, squishy body. Um, so that's all your snails, clams, octopus, things like that. So those are your most common animal phylums that we learned about and we observed last year. Okay, moving on to plants. All right, so we have two basic groups. Plants are classified a little bit differently. Um, they still have, you know, scientific names and things like that, but they are grouped basically into two major categories. Um, they are eukarya, first of all. They have eukaryotic cells, and then they're kingdom plantae. And then after that, we kind of group them into two groups, like I said, the vascular and the non-vascular. Let's start with these because they're really, really simple. The non-vascular uh, plants, they don't grow up and out. They don't have roots. They don't have stems. They have no way to transport water or any nutrients. So you think to yourself, well, how do they get water? They actually transport it from cell wall to cell wall. So actually cell to cell, side by side. So they don't grow tall. Like I said, they only grow kind of like as a ground cover. So the most popular one, of course, is moss. You can see it here growing all over the trees. Um, or liverworts, which is another popular one in this area. I think moss is probably the most common. And the nice thing about moss is it can grow anywhere. It doesn't need roots or ground or soil. It can grow on a rock. It can grow on a tree trunk. Um, so that's it's kind of adaptable that way. It can grow in places like the tundra in Alaska because it doesn't really need soil to grow. Um, our larger group of plants are the vascular plants, and unlike non-vascular, they actually have roots. They have a transport system. They have stems. They have leaves. They have, you know, trees, have trunks. They grow up and out. Underneath the vascular category, we split it into two more groups, the seeded plants that produce seeds and the ones that produce spores, and we call them seedless. Now, a fern, they're very popular this time of year, um, beautiful, you know, kind of shady plants that a lot of people um, get to hang on their front porch or put out in pots and things like that. So if you get a chance to look at one, you'll notice that they do not have seeds. They produce a spore. So popular ones are ferns, horsetails, and club mosses. Not mosses, but club mosses. Now the seeded plants are very common. Most produce seeds. Um, they reproduce sexually. Um, some examples are, you know, oak trees, sunflowers, tulips, roses, you name it. And then underneath this category, we split it into two more groups. These both produce seeds. The angiosperms produce fruits and flowers. 
and the gymnosperms produce cones usually. The biggest group of gymnosperms are the conifers. Conifers produce cones. There's the word right there. You can actually see it. Okay, it's called a naked seed. That's what it means. That's what gymnosperm means in Latin. Okay, and this right here is an example of an angiosperm. They produce fruits and flowers, so apple trees, daylilies, and roses. So really review this page. It's a little confusing. It definitely bears review, so please review this at home as you're going over your notes. Okay, very important, very, very, very important. Carolus Linnaeus, the scientist that is credited with developing this two-part naming system. All living things um, that have been identified have been given a scientific name. I'm going to delete that. Have been given a scientific name. All right. I've already highlighted some of this for you. The process or the system that Carolus Linnaeus came up with is called binomial nomenclature. Binomial meaning two names and nomenclature meaning naming system. Those two names that I keep talking about are just the genus level and the species level of that taxonomy that we were talking about earlier, those eight layers. So scientific names are always Latin or Greek. If they are typed, they are always italicized. The genus is always capital or capitalized, and the species is always lowercase. I can see this being a good SOL question where they put down a bunch of these different scientific names and ask you which one is written correctly. That's kind of a, a good question to ask. I don't know if they're going to ask that, obviously, but it's kind of something to be on the lookout for. Look at this one, Homo sapien. Those are the human beings. That's our scientific name. It means wise man, in case you're wondering. Ursus maritimus. That is the polar bear. Ursus is the polar, or I'm sorry, the bear um, genus, the big bears. And then Canis familiaris is just your common dog, okay, which derives from the wolf. All dogs evolve from wolves, as we know. So why do, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, why give organisms scientific names? Or why do scientists um, actually do this? Why don't we just call a dog a dog instead of making it confusing and calling it Canis familiaris? And that's because um, they are, you know, all called different things around the world. Every living thing, depending on what language you speak. Sometimes even in this country, we call different things uh, by different names based on where we live. Some of you call um, lightning bugs, lightning bugs. Others call them fireflies. And they have one common scientific name. Um, the puma, the cougar, and the mountain lion are all the same organism. They're all Felis concolor. But based on where we live in this country, we call them different things. So it kind of unifies all languages and specifies each organism. Okay, so Carolus Linnaeus, let's highlight his name. Very important. Binomial nomenclature. Homo sapien, Ursus maritimus, Canis familiaris. Those are good examples. Okay, moving on. All right, next unit. Energy flow is how energy, which comes from the sun, moves through an ecosystem. We all need energy in order to survive on this planet. Every living thing needs a source of energy. The planet's source of energy is the sun, but how do we get that energy? How do we harness it and put it through all of the living things on this planet? That's what this unit is all about. All right, so here is your common energy pyramid. All right, so with always, always, well, first of all, it starts with the sun, but thank goodness for the producers, the plants of the world. I'm going to type that in here. Let's see. These are the plants. Okay. Plants are the producers. Thank goodness for them. Because of photosynthesis, they are able to harness the sun's energy and turn it into a usable form for animals, which, of course, is in the form of glucose. They turn the sun's energy into an edible form called glucose. All right. And that way, the primary consumers, which are generally your herbivores, remember this word, sorry, there we go, your herbivores are your plant eaters. They eat the plants, we call them primary or first level consumers, all right? Secondary consumers eat the primary consumers. So most of the time they're carnivores, which are, oh my gosh, I can't type this morning, are carnivores, which are animals that only eat meat, but sometimes they are omnivores, which eat both plants and animals. Of course, omnivores can exist down here as well. You can write that on your paper if you would like to. And then finally, so it goes plants, which are producers. Energy goes to the primary consumer, whose energy goes to the secondary consumers, who finally goes to the 
tertiary or third level consumers. Again, usually your <laughs> um, top level predators in the ecosystem, like your bears, your great white sharks, your you know, owls and eagles, humans are at the top of the food chain, lions, depending on what ecosystem an organism lives in, generally the ones at the top of the food chain are the tertiary consumers. And they can be, let's see if I can type that right, there we go, they can be carniv usually carnivores, but they can be omnivores like bears and things like that, and humans. Now, let me go back to this really quickly. So notice that this pyramid starts down here is where the largest section is and up here at the tertiary consumers is the smallest. That is because as we move up the energy pyramid, we start down here with as much energy as possible and at each level, energy is lost. That's because the primary consumers are using it up. They have to use it up to live. They don't have as much energy to give away to their prey or their uh, predators because they're using that energy up to do everything it takes to stay alive. And the same thing with the secondary consumers. Their energy is used up. They don't have as much to give to the tertiary consumers. So energy is lost at each level as we move up the pyramid. Okay. So here's a bunch of ladybugs. They love to gather together like this. It's really cute. All members of the same species in an area is called a population. Kind of like the population here at Bull Run. There's about 1,200 kids. Um, that is all children in one area, so it's all members of the same species in one area. That is a population. When we take all of those populations together, we call it a community, which is the same reason we call neighborhoods communities, because literally everything that's in there is alive, all grouped together. All the plants, all the birds, all the people, all the dogs, all the fish, all the turtles, you name it. Everything living in one area is called a community. And then we take all the communities, everything in the community, plus the abiotic factors, and we throw biotic and abiotic factors together, and we call that an ecosystem. Biotic means all of the living things. Abiotic means all of the non-living things. But we need them. We need the sun. We need the water. We need the air. We need the soil. So all of that together creates what's called an ecosystem. Okay, types of symbiosis. So, symbiosis, first of all, generally means two organisms that live together and at least one of them benefits from the other. At least one benefits. Uh, mutualism is where they both benefit. Um, a very popular example that we've all seen in the movie Nemo is the sea anemone and the clownfish. The clownfish gets protection um, because it is immune to the anemone's um, venom, because it's a, remember the anemone is a um, cnidarian, it has stinging cells. The clownfish is immune to that, so it gets protection and a place to live. The anemone actually feeds off of the clownfish's droppings or the microorganisms that is brought in by the clownfish. So it actually gets food. So commensalism is um, another example, and that is where one organism benefits while the other is unaffected, which means it's not helped, but it's not harmed. An example of that is a barnacle and a whale. The barnacle lives on the whale, but the whale doesn't even notice, probably doesn't even care, doesn't feel it. Um, the barnacle obviously gets a place to live. The remora fish swims alongside the shark. We've seen those in a lot of videos. It gets protection. It gets scraps of food. The shark does not seem to pay any attention to the remora. For some reason, it doesn't feed off of it. It doesn't prey upon it. So that is a commensalism relationship. Finally, parasitism is a parasite. And that is where one organism benefits and one is harmed. Okay, and that's like a tick in a human. If you've ever had a tick bite, they're generally feeding off your blood and possibly even transmitting a disease. So that's definitely bad. The tick wins, the human loses. Okay, um, a lot of time dogs get, you know, tapeworms, heartworms, things like that. And dogs can, you know, get really sick or die as a result. So that would be a negative. So plus one and a negative, plus one and neutral, plus one, plus one. Okay, review those. All right, I'm going to stop there for now, and we'll continue with this, um, the cycles needed for life uh, momentarily. Okay, so the cycles needed for all living things. Um, I'm going to kind of ignore the water cycle. Not that it should be ignored. It's extremely important, but I think you already reviewed that in your sixth grade material. 
Um, I'm going to focus first on the nitrogen cycle. Now, nitrogen is extremely important to all living things because plants need it to make chlorophyll and animals need it to make protein. Um, so if you think about, you know, fertilizer for your grass, guess what the main ingredient is? Nitrogen. And think about what's in all of your protein shakes. Nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is sort of a, it creates the proteins, which is kind of a, you know, catalyst to create new cells and growth and things like that in your body. So extremely important. Now, here's the interesting thing. About 78% of the atmosphere is something called N2, two atoms of nitrogen bonded together chemically. Um, and that seems great. If we need nitrogen and there's 78% of it in the atmosphere, it's like, okay, perfect. No, not that easy. It is unusable in this state. Uh, N2 is not usable for any living thing. So before we can uh, utilize that nitrogen that's in the atmosphere, we have to fix it. Nitrogen must be fixed and it goes through a nitrogen fixation cycle. Now, two ways that nitrogen can be fixed. Now, atmospheric nitrogen is fixed by lightning. And in the soil, uh, nitrogen is fixed by special bacteria that live in the roots of plants called legumes, which are like soybeans and alfalfa, clover, peanuts. All of those are legume plants. And in their roots are special bacteria that fix the nitrogen. And then when it's fixed, it becomes free nitrogen. So it's just little plain nitrogen atoms floating around. But the nice thing about that is that they can bond with other elements and create other compounds that are usable. For example, like um, ammonia, uh, ammonium, not ammonium, ammonia. Thank you. Anyway, so now that the nitrogen has been fixed in plants, they are able to absorb the usable nitrogen in the form of ammonia. And then they use that nitrogen to make their chlorophyll and do all the other things they need to do. So then, very similar to the energy um, pyramid, we can either eat the plant to get the nitrogen we need, or we eat the animal that eats the plant that gets the nitrogen. Same exact thing. So let's just say this nitrogen here goes into this cow. The cow consumes the nitrogen, and guess what? Any excess nitrogen comes out the other end. In their waste, in all animal droppings, in all waste is excess nitrogen. That goes back into the soil, where it is fixed again by bacteria and goes back into the plant, back into the animal, into the soil again. And this little cycle right here kind of can go on for a while. So it's like a little mini cycle within a bigger cycle. Now, when there's excess nitrogen in the soil, it runs off into streams and creeks and rivers and things like that, where another special type of bacteria called denitrifying bacteria, sends the nitrogen back to the atmosphere as N2, where it starts the cycle all over again. Okay. Now, the carbon cycle is kind of straightforward. I feel like you already know this. Now, carbon is one of these elements that is found in every single living thing. Um, that's what makes us organic. In fact, there's a whole branch of science called organic chemistry that is devoted just to the carbon atom because carbon is so versatile. It can also bond with lots of other different things. So we know that CO2, carbon dioxide, is in the atmosphere. CO2. But it's kind of a poisonous gas, so we don't like this kind of carbon. But the nice thing is plants take in the CO2, and they produce another big carbon molecule, glucose, carbon. It's a carbohydrate. That's what it is, another big macromolecule. So plant takes in CO2, produces glucose, gives off O2, right? We all know that plants give off oxygen as a result of photosynthesis. All right, so then animals take in the oxygen, and we take in the glucose, and then we obviously send CO2 back to the atmosphere. And that's how we get our energy. Now, remember how I told you that every living thing is made of carbon? When our bodies die, when plants die, when animals die, when fungus dies, it all gets decomposed back into the soil. And that carbon breaks down very, very slowly. When we burn any old evidence of carbon, for example, wood for fire or even fossil fuels, 
Now, the reason they're called that is because they're made from, the carbon is actually harnessed from um, oil, which is made from 100 million year old dinosaur remains. It's their excess carbon that's been broken down, but it takes 100 million years to get it to that point which is why fossil fuels are not a great source of energy because once we use them, you have to wait another 100 million years to get more. So when we burn fossil fuels or wood for fire, we send that carbon back to the atmosphere again where the cycle starts all over. All right, moving on. Food chains versus food webs. Um, let me reset this really quickly. Now, a food chain, just what's the difference? It's pretty simple. Food chains tend to be more linear which means they make a straight line. They only show one path of energy. So they're not as accurate for an entire ecosystem, whereas a food web shows multiple food chains within an ecosystem. Now let me show you an example of a food chain. So here we have a producer, which is always a plant, primary consumer, in this case a type of worm or flatworm or whatever that is, secondary consumer, and then tertiary consumer. So Again, this only shows one path of energy. It's not as accurate for an entire ecosystem because we know that not just this worm is eating this plant, okay? Many other herbivores are eating this plant right here. Now, the main thing to remember are these arrows right here. What do these arrows indicate? This is a really, really important question. The arrows indicate which direction the energy is going. That's an important thing. You might want to write that down. The arrows in both food chains and food webs indicate the direction that the energy is going. So the plant's energy is going to the primary consumer's body. The primary consumer's energy is going to the bird. The bird's energy is going to the larger bird, the hawk. Okay. All right, next section. The last two units, biomes and human impact. Okay, biomes, I have this uh, really, really good movie trailer here, but instead of watching it now, we'll probably show it to you when we come in um, in the next few days to visit with you and review. But a biome is just basically a large-scale ecosystem. Um, we categorize them based on, you know, climate, um, rainfall, and even some of the organisms that live there and the adaptations that they share. There are six major terrestrial biomes, which of course, terra in Latin means land. I think it also means that in Spanish. All right, the six major land biomes are desert, the rainforest, and there's actually two types, tropical, which is hot, temperate, which is moderate. The grasslands, again, there are two. The savanna is really hot. The prairie is more temperate. Um, the deciduous forest, which is where we live, the coniferous forest, and finally, the tundra. And there are two major aquatic biomes, which means water, oceans, which is salt water, and then fresh water, lakes, ponds, rivers, etc. Now, the desert, less than 25 centimeters of rain per year, and sometimes it doesn't rain at all. Um, it's not necessarily the hottest climate, although we think of it that way. Um, just because there is no cloud cover usually, there's nothing to really insulate the atmosphere or the hot um, air. So at night when the sun goes down, it actually gets really, really cold. Organisms have to, uh, adaptations to survive with very little water. Some animals that live there never even drink water. They get the water they need from the food that they eat. Uh, many plants have really huge trunks and shallow roots. So think of a cactus and then like the shallow roots are right under the soil. So when it does rain, they can absorb that water really quickly. Um, most of the animals are nocturnal to avoid that daytime heat. Um, there's one animal, the fennec fox, that has huge ears that helps it radiate the heat away from its body. A lot of animals um, are really well camouflaged to the desert surroundings. And some examples, the cactus, reptiles, small mammals, and birds. All right, two types of rainforest. Sometimes it rains here every single day. Not all day every day, but more than 300 centimeters of rainfall per year. The tropical rainforest, which we think of um, in parts of India and in obviously in parts of the Amazon rainforest, which is down in South America. And there's also temperate rainforests, and that would be like the Pacific Northwest, like Seattle, Washington, Oregon, where it rains about nine months out of the year. Now, because there's so much rain, the trees there, first of all, they have tons of trees. They can support a lot of trees, um, but they also have amazing growth rates. The trees are really, really tall. 
the rainforests have the greatest amount of biodiversity in the world, which means they have the most different living things um, in one place. Because there are so many trees, the plants have to compete for light, and they grow toward it as fast as they can, which is called phototropism. Some of the examples of animals that live there, macaws, jaguars, poison arrow frogs, boa constrictors, monkeys, but pretty much name anything, and it probably lives in a rainforest. The grasslands, they get enough water to support lots of plants, but not a lot of trees, very few trees, no forests, only tall grasses. Um, grasslands are home to the largest herbivores on the planet. Think elephants, giraffes, um, bison. Now, the plain states in the United States are known as the prairie. This is a temperate grassland. We sometimes call it the breadbasket because it supplies so much wheat and corn, oats and barley. Um, and areas closer to the equator, like the African grasslands, are called savannas. And that's kind of like the Lion King. That's a savanna. And here are some examples of the animals that live there. All right, deciduous forest is where we live. Um, they are categorized by deciduous trees, which means they lose their leaves in the winter to adapt to the cold winters by going dormant. So they lose their leaves. Um, we have four distinct seasons. It's a very beautiful uh, biome, to be honest with you. Many animals adapt by hibernating, kind of like the trees. They go to sleep for the winter or they migrate south. If you just look outside, you can see any example of things that live in a deciduous forest. We get at least 50 centimeters of rain a year, which is enough to support plenty of trees. And then we have also another type of forest, the coniferous forest, sometimes called boreal, which means north. And these are characterized by long, snowy winters and very short summers. The trees that live there are conifers. That's the biggest group of gymnosperms. And that's because they have very short, waxy needles that helps them survive those cold temperatures. They don't lose their leaves. They don't have to. Their needles can survive the really cold and snowy uh, winters. And that means they photosynthesize all year long. So sometimes we call them the lungs of the earth because they produce so much oxygen. These um, boreal forests are found in northern Canada and Russia. And some examples are lynx, moose, caribou, birds, and wolves. Finally, the tundra. Believe it or not, the tundra is kind of like a desert. It doesn't get very much uh, precipitation at all. Oops, there we go. Now, the biggest difference between a tundra and a true desert is the trees. The tundra does not have any trees, and that's because of this layer of soil that remains permanently frozen year-round, so no tree roots can penetrate that layer of permafrost. The only plants that grow in a tundra are grasses and moss, and they only grow during that short summer. The animals that live there are highly adapted. Most have very thick coats of fur, thick skin, Lots and lots of fat layers of blubber to help keep them warm. So the tundras like Antarctica or the Arctic Circle. Northern Canada, Alaska is a tundra. Um, I think Greenland is considered a tundra. Okay, water. This one's pretty easy. Fresh water covers only 3% of the earth, which is streams, lakes, ponds, rivers. And um, only of that, 1% of that is only usable for humans. And then salt water is the majority of the water on this planet, which covers about 72% of the Earth. Okay, human impact. What have we done to our planet? We have done a lot of bad things, and we keep doing them, although there are laws now to protect our Earth and try to reverse the effects of global warming. So this is the practice of managing resources wisely and not wasting, and of course that is conservation. We should always reduce, reuse, and recycle. Conserve what we have. Don't waste. Some ways to conserve resources. Reduce, so think about the things that you might do at home. Do you use biodegradable products? Do you only buy what you need? Do you turn off water while you brush your teeth? Do you turn off lights when you leave a room? Um, do you try to use like a, do any of you have a um, Prius or some other like sort of hybrid vehicle? Those are getting more and more popular. Um, reusing things, refillable water bottles. Sometimes you can use the same backpack for more than just one year. You can make trash to treasure items. Shop consignment. Oh, this is a big one. Use the reusable uh, grocery bags. And if you use the plastic ones, you can always 
Recycle. Utilize your community recycle bins or services and contribute all plastics, aluminum, and paper possible. Contaminating the earth is called pollution and some of the effects of pollution, the greenhouse effect, too much carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, traps harmful radiation, which is heat, and warms the earth unnaturally. That leads to a loss of natural habitats, which then leads to an extinction of species, which reduces biodiversity, makes the air quality extremely unhealthy, it's very expensive to maintain, control, and clean up, and it's frankly disgusting. The greenhouse effect, like we just said, is when the sun's radiation obviously enters the Earth's atmosphere, which is a good thing, but a lot of time it actually bounces back off and goes back out into space. Um, but when we have this thick layer of these greenhouse gases caused by all of that trapped, you know, it's all trapped by that CO2, um, it heats the uh, Earth kind of unnaturally at a faster rate. And so that may have led to this global warming phenomenon that you hear about all time, you know, in the news and on TV. Now, deforestation is just that. It's removing a forest. Deforestation. It's one of the leading causes of air pollution. Less trees means less oxygen because they produce oxygen. It also means there's more CO2 in the atmosphere because trees take it out. And CO2 is deadly. Trees remove it. Don't take down the trees. It makes no sense. Although most people, the reason for deforestation a lot of times is agriculture or farming. Um, it causes a loss of habitats and ecosystems, eventual extinction, flooding, um, erosion, landslides, because trees soak up water. They, they need tons of water. So when it rains like crazy, most of the time, trees will soak up that water in their roots. If you cut all the trees down, there's nothing left to soak up the water, and it creates all kinds of problems. So think about where you live. Most of us live in this area that has been developed really in the last 20 years. A lot of this area where you live used to be a lot of farmland or forests, and most of it has been cut down just like this to make room for schools, highways, movie theaters, and housing development. Why is this bad? Well, the reason why is go back to every single one of these bulleted comments right here, and that is why it is a negative thing. All right, so we talked about how deforestation is because of um, one of the main reasons is agriculture, which is farming. So how can we conserve the soil? How can we farm better? Crop rotation, contour plowing, conservation plowing. Very simple. First of all, yes, start stop cutting down trees. But if we have to farm, crop rotation, plant different things in different fields every year. Don't plant cotton in the same place every single year. It deprives the soil of nutrients. Contour plowing, which is this picture right here. You plow the land in curves versus straight lines because it actually cuts down on erosion. And conservation plowing is very simple as well. Take all the dead stalks and weeds from the previous year's crop and churn them back into the soil and return those nutrients to make the soil richer and healthier. Okay, two words that you probably need to know, a point source and a non-point source. This is very easy. So for pollution, a point source of pollution is one you can point to. Can you see it? Can you point to it? It's a point source. If I can see big plumes of smoke coming out of a factory polluting the atmosphere, I can point to it. It's a point source of pollution. Now, a non-point source, let's say I dumped a bunch of chemicals into a stream near my house and those chemicals um, shed or, you know, carried all the way down to the Chesapeake Bay. And now the Chesapeake Bay have all these chemicals and we don't know where they came from. That is a non-point source of pollution. When you don't know where the pollutant came from, you don't know the source of it, we call it a non-point source. Sometimes, now these cows would be a point source, but sometimes cows can be in farmland hundreds of yards away, and their waste, their fecal matter, can actually flow down to lakes that you swim in. So the lakes might have a lot of feces, you don't, you're not aware of it because you can't see where it's coming from, and it gets more and more polluted. Now, an invasive species is a species that is not native to an area. It may have been brought by um, p 
people or it could have accidentally come over with a cargo ship or something like that. But they are um, detrimental, which means bad for the environment. They don't necessarily have any natural predators. So when that's the case, they can disrupt the food web and they can destroy an entire, entire ecosystem. Some examples. The lionfish is was probably, they think, released by irresponsible pet owners that had a lionfish in their aquarium. They're not native to the Caribbean Sea, but they've been released and they are doing quite well and they have no natural predators because these spines are venomous and they are eating voraciously, which means like crazy. They're eating up so many natural species that live in the Caribbean and they're really disrupting the food chain. The kudzu vine. You may have seen this driving down 95 um, on highways. It was actually brought over to stop erosion on the Mississippi River back in the 1930s. But I guess people didn't know back then how aggressive it was. And it literally suffocates other healthy plants. It grows so fast and there's so much of it that it, you know, it cuts out the sunlight to other plants that it grows on top of. And then those plants suffocate. Zebra mussels, it takes millions and millions and millions of dollars a year to try to eradicate all of these zebra mussels from Lake Michigan and um, all of the Great Lakes and the rivers that lead into those lakes because they get caught up in pipes, they get caught up in boats, and they re you can't see their larvae. They reproduce um, tons of larvae at once, and then once they get you know stuck on here and start to grow, they cause millions of dollars of damage. All right, finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about is eutrophication. Now, this is when we over-fertilize. We talked about nitrogen a little while ago. When we over-fertilize or we have like too many cows in one area and all of that excess nitrogen from the soil runs off into streams, rivers, and lakes. And what happens is algae or plants, they love nitrogen and they go crazy. They have like this huge algae growth called an algal bloom. Okay, remember plants love nitrogen. It's a huge vitamin for them. Now then what happens is um, the algae, you know, they can't live forever. First of all, they do two things. They block out all of the light. Algae grow on the surface and they block out all of the light for plants that grow on the bottom of the rivers and the lakes and things like that. So um, it kills those plants from lack of light. And then the bacteria that feed on the algae because bacteria feed on algae, they use up all of the dissolved oxygen in the water and leave no more oxygen for the aquatic um, animals. So this is what eutrophication looks like. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Um, it occurs a lot of times in the summer when all that runoff from ponds, um, all that nitrogen, not from ponds, from yards and things like that gets into these ponds that don't have a lot of movement, um, a lot of current. And the algae goes crazy, and that's what the algal bloom is right there. You can see how it blocks the light for plants underneath, and all of the bacteria that feed off of this, they use up all of the oxygen in the water. All right, well, that's the review. Um, we'll be coming in for a few days to answer any specific questions that you have, but you will do great. Um, eighth grade SOL is usually um, has great performance scores, and we are very proud of you. We know you're going to do awesome. So good luck, and we will see you soon.